Yes, hello. Good evening, everyone. This is Christian Vasquez, uh, one of the board of director of the American Institute of Architects, Middle East. I'll be your host and moderator for uh, this webinar tonight. First of all, we would like to thank our um, sponsors, um, Technal, Golf Consult, Wicona, and Ecotone. All right, the, Amer uh, the American Institute of Architects Middle East chapter is a chapter of the AIA was established in 2010 to serve the professional interests of the growing numbers of AIA members, architects practicing in the Middle East and North Africa region. When it was formed, it was the fifth international chapter of the AIA and it's just this short period of time has grown to become the largest international chapter with over 500 members. The domain of this chapter includes the following countries in the MENA region, Algeria, Bahrain, Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Morocco, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Tunisia, UAE, and Yemen. The administrative headquarters of the chapter are in the UAE capital city, Abu Dhabi, with regional representatives in the member countries. Each year, AIA Middle East sponsors continuing education lectures and talk throughout the region to help architects maintain their licensure, set the industry standard in contracts documents with more than 100 forms and contracts used in the design and construction industry, conducts markets research and provides analysis of the economic factors that affect the business of architecture. We serve as an advocate of the architecture profession. We promote design excellence and outstanding professional achievements through an award program. We host the annual AIA Middle East year-end conference in different member countries each year. The conference is open to all industry professionals. The American Institute of Architects is the voice of the architectural profession in the US and the resource of its members in service to society. Through a culture of innovation, AIA empowers its members and inspires creation of a better built environment. You can visit our website, www.aiamiddleeast.org. Now, the AIA Middle East webinar series, masters architects, designers, innovation leaders, research experts, product developers, and business leaders share their visions, inspiration, and take part in bold conversations about redefining what it means to be an architect in this time, day, and age. We are entering a new age in architecture, one where we expect our buildings to deliver far more than just a shelter. We want buildings that inspires us while helping the environment, buildings that delights our senses while serving the need of the community. This course is aimed at architects, urban designers, and planners wishing to gain the intellectual, theoretical, and practical knowledge and skills essential to understanding and shaping the future city. An overview of the design practices, methodologies, and visions that responds to the current and future trend of the industry. Nowadays, the world is undergoing a major shift in the way it is being experienced and conceived. Recent technologies have made it possible for different realities to exist and merge with one we live in. The term extended reality, an umbrella term comprises of virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality, allows people to escape every la everyday life into this new form of being that can be designed, adopted, and harnessed to improve the way we experience our surroundings. In today's fast-paced fast world, how is the notion of the urban address in extended reality? How can these new technologies be injected into architecture, urban planning and design, education and practice, leading to the creation of enhanced urban experiences and design of functional, sustainable, context-sensitive spaces. Our guest speaker for tonight, Dr. Janset Shawas, PhD, is an 
assistant professor at the School of Architecture and Built Environment, German, uh, German Jordanian University. Her research interests focus on history and theory of architecture, urban planning and design, especially issues relevant to developing new methods for localizing urbanism and promoting community involvement in shaping their urban environment. Her professional expertise includes planning of major urban development projects in Jordan and MENA region. Nermin Margie is an architect specializing on augmented reality development and cross-platform application building for architecture, urban planning, and design. She has uh, participated in projects of architectural design, city planning, and heritage con uh, conservation, and has recently undertaken intensive research on applications of augmented reality in education of architectural and urban design for her master's degree at School of Architecture and Built Environment, German Jordanian University. Without further ado, friends, colleagues, please welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Janet and Nermin. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Okay. Nermin, if you can share the presentation, please. Okay, just give me one second. Uh, so, one minute. One minute. I'm sorry. All right. Okay. 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 So, um, welcome everyone, and thank you very much for the uh, AIA for hosting us and for allowing us to introduce our work. And I'm really pleased um, and happy and uh, excited uh, to see the um, uh, the Middle East chapter being very active, and I'm very much looking forward to attending uh, all of the activities and lectures. Um, so today we're going to share some, uh, some work where, where we have been working on for the past year, uh, which um, explores the use of augmented reality in architecture and urban design. So as I was introduced, I'm an architect and I teach urban design and architecture at the um, uh, School of Architecture and German, um, Jordan University. And I have been doing it for about 10 years now. And we are always looking for new ways to, um, to expand our knowledge, to expand and develop the applications, to engage people in more um, immersive manners, and to make um, urban planning, urban design more relevant to the end user, uh, as well as the students. Uh, next, please. Uh, I hope you can bear with us. I mean, um, uh, the presentation is very um, uh, graphically rich and we have some videos in the, um, in the slides. Uh, so I hope everyone's connection is, um, is good enough to, um, uh, to follow up. Um, yeah, so uh, um, uh, for example, in this slide, we, um, uh, it presents an example of uh, the use of augmented reality. Uh, this is a short video which was produced by a student uh, from the Bartlett School of Architecture at UCL. And it really shows uh, the application of uh, a layer of reality beyond what, what we know um, in our real terms. And uh, we are actually quite used to seeing this layer in some applications, such for example, in social media, in Snapchat, uh, in Instagram. Uh, so it has become to some extent a part of our life and it, it has a lot of potential for, for the future. So um, our question was, was how to harness the power of this new tool. Of course, this new old tool has been around for, for years now and how to implement it in architecture and um, urban design and planning. So as we know, as we all know that the process of urban design is quite um, uh, com complex. It has many layers to it. It's multifaceted and multidisciplinary. And often it has um, intangible inputs which are not uh, very easy to convey to the, um, uh, to the end user and to all of the stakeholders participating in the process. Uh, uh, at the same time, at the, at the current time, um, we are undergoing a major shift 
uh, towards the digital world and we, we are getting all of these amazing tools in our hands. And especially now with the COVID, uh, pan with the pandemic and um, uh, our heavy reliance on, um, on the internet and digital tools, uh, it, it presents a bigger, even bigger opportunity to apply these uh, new technologies um, um, and experiment with them to, to have a better and more advanced future. Uh, next, please. So um, um, what we will discuss today is the um, uh, different approaches to mixed virtual augmented reality, uh, which have developed at this point to a very advanced uh, um, um, level. Uh, and they are being integrated into education, engineering, architecture, and uh, to a less extent in urban design. So this uh, presentation will showcase the instrumentalization of augmented reality as a tool in architecture and urban design and, uh, and practice and question the limits of applicability and technical aspects of this process. So it's still a new tool and we're trying to experiment um, the extent of its application. In this presentation, of course, I will uh, do the introduction uh, and then um, uh, architect Nermin will uh, explain the concepts of um, uh, mixed reality, um, um, extended reality, virtual reality, and augmented reality. And then we will uh, talk about cases uh, in application in different disciplines and in architecture. And then we'll showcase two, two experiments we performed, one uh, which involves the classroom, the classroom of our urban design studio. Uh, and the other one involves an, a research experiment we conducted, which was related to, uh, um, uh, to uh, landscape design and, um, and urban design uh, in an actual place in Amman. And then Narmin will finish with uh, different uh, ideas of um, a very exciting future, so what's next, and how everyone can start with um, implementing augmented reality in their uh, profession. Uh, so please, Narmin. Okay, so uh, let's start with concepts and definitions. What is XR, MR, VR, and AR? So as, as mentioned, uh, extended reality, basically, it's an umbrella term. It's the largest of them all that comprises all of those other terms that we will uh, discuss later in this presentation. So we have um, virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. Um, and uh, extended reality is not limited to those three. So it refers to all the real and virtual combined environments and human machine interactions that are generated by computer technology and wearables. Uh, if we move forward to mixed reality, basically it's an emerging medium. It offers uh, the unique affordances by combining the physical and virtual worlds and allowing a personalized, personalized user control of the hybrid reality. So mixed reality is where you have to wear uh, head-mounted displays, such as the HoloLens, uh, any other um, instrument that allows you to view the virtual content and interact with it. So it is it adds the interactive element to augmented and virtual elements. When virtual reality is that it's a, it's a virtual environment, it is what completely immerses you in a virtual world, an environment that does not exist. You cannot see the real world around you when you're there. So you completely interact with a virtual environment and it allows you to step through the computer screen into this three-dimensional world where everything is basically virtual. Usually to experience also a virtual reality, you have to wear uh, head-mounted displays so you can actually be immersed in this virtual environment and you, you, don't, have, um, you don't see the, the real existing situation around you. On the contrary, we have augmented reality. Augmented reality is what allows virtual objects and information to coexist in the same space and provide real-time interaction. So you have the virtual environment, the virtual objects, uh, the 3D models, the information, everything that is overlaying the real uh, world that you are existing in. So it is a situation in which the real world context is dynamically overlaid with coherent location or context sensitive virtual information that you can actually interact with. So it augments your reality, it adds to it, it enriches the world as we experience it and it adds more information to it. Uh, so if you look at this uh, mixed reality continuum or spectrum, we have the real environment uh, and then we have AR, augmented reality and augmented virtuality 
they are part of mixed reality as we see in the graph. And then we have the virtual environment on the far right. And they are all part of this extended reality. Now, if you take a closer look to augmented reality itself, it also has a spectrum that uh, the more virtual your input is, or the more virtual the objects are that are um, occupying the space, it is, we can say that it's heavily augmented. Heavily augmented, it means that it has lots of virtual input. When it's slightly augmented, it means that it focuses more on the real world context. So um, as we say, um, to be immersed in something, what does it actually mean to be immersed? So there are actually three types of immersive system, systems. You have the non-immersive systems, which we mentioned, like which, which we deal with kind of every day on our computer screens or um, on our uh, mobile phones and everything. It's the virtual digital content that we deal with. We have the immersive systems where you are completely uh, placed in a virtual environment. You don't see anything that is actually real. And you have the semi-immersive systems. Uh, semi-immersive systems, they take some sort of um, real input from the real world, but they don't fully immerse you in, in that uh, environment, let's say. So uh, the word itself, it's used to refer to the act of completely immersing oneself in or diving into another artificial world. And that happens when you are in virtual reality, but in augmented reality, as we can see, um, why are we discussing the use of augmented reality in architecture or in urban design or in urban planning? Why not virtual reality systems? Well, virtual reality systems have actually been used quite uh, heavily in, in, uh, presenting, um, in uh, presenting architectural projects and urban design projects and what forth. But uh, augmented reality systems, especially in such a field as, as augmented reality, as, as architecture and urban design, you have to be in, in, in a, you have, there has to be a strong connection with the context, with the real environment. So augmented reality allows you to add that layer of extra information, that layer of extra data, extra um, models, let's say, or whatever that you design to the real context. It allows you to enrich it rather than replace it. So you, you continue working with the, with the real world and you enhance it. So they enhance reality by overlaying it with the information in a, in a complementary way, in a non-immersive way that enriches your perception of the real environment. While VR systems, um, they can be very, um, they, they can have a very strong effect on the user, yes, but they replace rather than complement reality by creating a new uh, immersive environment or completely new uh, world, let's say. So uh, as we see in the picture, you can see um, this person is using a mixed reality method, let's say a system where she's wearing the head mounted display and she's viewing this model of, of a city or an urban scape and she's uh, interacting with it. That is an example of mixed reality. So nowadays there are multiple tools and technologies that you can um, use to experience any of those systems. Um, you have the user tangible interfaces, which are basically huge screens or interfaces that you can actually uh, interact with and play with the virtual content and it reacts to your input. You have the handheld devices, uh, which are the most common, most efficient um, devices that you can use for such experiences. You have uh, the uh, head mounted displays, you have the glasses and so on. So um, what do you actually need to create an augmented reality uh, system or augmented reality experience? So the basic hardware, if you notice that you need a presence of a video camera, you need a camera to capture live images. You need significant storage, all right? You need a powerful processor to either to create the virtual or real objects or uh, to display those uh, virtual objects in real time. And you need an interface, so an operating system. So if you look at all those, all of them are available in, in the handheld devices that we use every day. And um, the more advanced this technology gets of handheld devices, the more you see how compatible it is to use those handheld devices, which offer portability, interactivity, connectivity, individuality. You can customize your phone as you wish, even uh, the provision of uh, GPS functions, as well as the smart operating systems. You have the Android, the iOS. So everything that you need for hardware terms is already available in this small device that's in your pocket. And if you notice, like one of the studies, it shows how people are slowly, um, the average time spent on using those mobile devices is increasing um, in comparison to using, let's see, the TV and you watching those digital experiences and so forth through your mobile device. So 
what are the types of augmented reality experiences that you can create or experience? Because um, I, I believe that most of you attending right now have in one way or another have played with augmented reality, whether it was um, in a Snapchat filter, uh, an Instagram filter, uh, Pokemon Go, whoever played that game, it's, it's almost all around us. And we need to uh, understand how it's actually being made so we can actually use it to our own benefit in, in fields such as architecture and urban design. So we have the most basic or oh, the classic form of augmented reality experiences, which is the marker based. The marker based, and we have the marker list augmented reality. From its name, the marker based, it relies on having a target, a target image, a target object that it can recognize. So once you scan that object or you scan that image, it overlays it, it provides uh, 3D content, uh, videos, animation, anything else that enriches that experience of what you're actually seeing. So from the video, it's a video from uh, Apple store in the visitor center in California. So they have this great model. It's, it's basically an aluminum model uh, of the park that they are planning to uh, create or to um, construct. So the people can go into the visitor center and once they hold their iPad, or their handheld devices and scan that model, it overlays it with information uh, of the final design, uh, the vegetation, the energy consumption, even there's a wind simulation and everything that they want the people to know about this new design. So it can only be, it can, it cannot only, it can be more than just an image. It can be a model. It can be anything that you uh, desire to be for the target. target. As for the markerless augmented reality, so it does not, from its name, it does not require a prior knowledge of the user's environment to place the, uh, the, the 3D content in that space. It does not require a marker. It uses other sorts of technology. So it can be location-based, just like the game Pokemon Go. It depends on your location uh, through utilizing GPS services. Uh, another, like one of the newest or most used uh, technologies nowadays is the uh, SLAM, Simultaneous Localization and Mapping Technology. So what this does, as seen in the video here, is that it um, maps your environment in real time. So as you walk around, it maps it, it creates uh, this um, layer of, of information, it, it creates point cloud or points that tell the device where you are currently in your, in your um, environment. So as you see the map that is being created while the person is walking inside the space, it detects feature points and it recognizes where the person currently is. And based on that map that is created, you can create augmented reality experiences. So it's quite accurate. So it understands the physical world through those feature points and it makes it possible to recognize the objects, to recognize the scenes and instantly track the, the environment that you're in and overlay interactive augmented experiences using this technology. And um, Funny enough, it's already available in all of our uh, devices. And if you've noticed, even the newest iPhone has a LiDAR scanner for this sole purpose, that it can actually map in real time your environment and you can add augmented devices and even laser scan very complex surfaces and objects and use it for that purpose. So now I will um, hand the presentation to my colleague. So Dr. Janfet, she can tell you more about the applications of augmented reality in multiple fields. Um, yes, so as Nami mentioned, um, and as we all know, uh, augmented reality has been with us for a while now, and it's been applied in medicine, entertainment, uh, manufacturing, robotics, and of course in the military, uh, where they have all the funding they might need. Uh, next, please. So, um, for example, Um, um, for example, as we can see in these uh, images, um, um, actually it is being applied for the uh, facilitation of the use of uh, certain equipment uh, in a factory or in a laboratory setting. So the use of augmented reality, it really uh, makes simpler to visualize complex spatial relationships and abstract concepts, which would be otherwise difficult. Uh, build essential skills uh, that cannot be developed in other technology advanced environments, as we will see in a bit. Uh, recreate experiences that are difficult or impossible to encounter in the real world, um, as we will also see, and interact with 2D and 3D uh, virtual objects in real environments. So to uh, give examples on these points, for example, on the, um, on the left of the slide, we have uh, a model of the visionary city, which is actually, if you, um, if you are uh, familiar with it, the um, 
a proposal for a walking city by Archigram, uh, which was a very revolutionary um, 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 architectural office producing very interesting ideas in the 60s. Uh, so these models were produced by students um, um, or by, um, uh, by architects and they were implemented in their direct surroundings so they could actually go there and explore uh, these models in the real scale and interact with them. Uh, for example, in the middle, we can see the applications of AR in, in medicine, uh, especially um, um, like in, on, the top, um, uh, on the top image, we can see um, 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 a layout of the organs of the human body. So if you scan some, someone's uh, body, you can actually see where the different organs are located and which makes it uh, much easier to, to learn this uh, information. Uh, below it uh, is a, an example of learning of uh, geometry and um, um, other topics and different um, uh, high school classes which, which would be um, more difficult to, to implement in 2D or what have you. So they are actually giving um, uh, more excitement and more direct visualization of the different information that students learn. And on the left, we have applications in laboratory settings and in factories and in um, uh, the military. So for example, um, I'm sure we have seen, we have all seen examples of them from movies and different settings. Uh, so we have pilots uh, being trained um, on uh, flying planes and drones and uh, uh, going into um, uh, virtual settings um, in war zones. In medicine, the AR is being um, very uh, strongly developed uh, and we already have some successful um, uh, examples. Uh, for example, we have the AR AI uh, system and the um, X Vision um, 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 system, which uh, have already applied um, AR in, in surgery. So this gives a lot of uh, potential for, um, uh, for distance surgery and distance medicine, which is really excellent, especially um, uh, when the, the medical staff cannot access the patient directly. So as you can see from the images, uh, the, the AR enables the surgeon to visualize um, uh, the problem um, um, before even cutting through the skin. Uh, and it is, uh, it is connected ideally to uh, imaging uh, devices like MRI, uh, CT scan, or whatever is needed to provide um, uh, updated data about the status of the, of the patient. Uh, in architecture, which is more relevant uh, to us as architects, um, uh, as we know that um, building information technology uh, has been with us for a while now, and it has been really developed and uh, integrated into uh, a number of um, uh, a number of um, um, uh, programs that we use, especially Revit, for example. Uh, however, um, um, however, it is all confined to the office uh, mostly. So, for example, even if we uh, inject uh, our um, uh, project or supplement our drawings with rich information and data. It, it, um, the product remains uh, printed out um, 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 sheets uh, of paper. In best case scenario, we can take these sheets in PDF form and take them to the, uh, to the site. So uh, what is needed is to actually have a, um, the richness of the, um, uh, of the data, of the information, uh, to be supplemented in 3D uh, on the site itself. So for example, here we can see that AR actually enables us to, um, uh, to present this data in 3D on site. So even the skilled and unskilled uh, professionals on site who, who are not um, fully involved in the drawings um, in the office can see them and can visualize them and can trace them um, uh, with, uh, with great accuracy um, um, on the construction site itself. Uh, next, please. Uh, of course, we can also present uh, the projects that we design um, in, in site. And this actually has been maybe the, um, um, like the most important, most significant aspect of AR for, uh, for our own work. So um, uh, presenting the project in, in its actual scale and its actual location is something we have not been able to achieve, um, um, I mean, uh, easily so far. Uh, so um, it can be done, as Narmin said, in a number of ways. So for example, first we have the uh, marker-based uh, technique we, we, where we scan an image, a specific image, um, um, and that from that image we have uh, the 3D design, uh, and then we can manipulate it, we can enlarge it, we can make it smaller, we can go in it and uh, experience it in, in all of its detail. And uh, the other one, as um, we've seen before, Nermin, next please. Uh, 
uh, is uh, seeing the implemented uh, project on site in its actual scales. For example, here on the left, we have a video of a um, of a model uh, from, uh, well, um, I imagine from Revit and it's being um, implemented with Unity. So uh, we can go through it, we can walk around it, we can uh, experience the spaces. Um, of course, here, for example, we see that the, the level of render and the level of finish is uh, quite basic to allow for higher speed of implementation and so that the um, um, our tools can actually operate it and then we will talk about it a bit more however it also has a lot of potential so for example here on a higher uh, floor we can see a higher level of detail and um, uh, actually let me can you go back uh, a bit because i want to explain something about the image on the right so the image on the right was actually produced from our urban design course so uh, what we see here is the um, uh, um, the shadow of myself and our students standing behind a rendered um, glass wall in a building that was designed in that place. So um, the, um, um, you actually can experience what the material is going to look like. You can experience, you can see in reality the, the effect of light, the effect of um, the environment on your project. So here we are standing inside the building and we are looking through this uh, a glass wall to the exterior and it is uh, giving us uh, this kind of effect a very re realistic effect um, next please and uh, this of course would help with uh, especially um, um, easily with the uh, interior design projects um, uh, it would uh, facilitate for people to uh, uh, to imagine what different finishes different uh, colors different furniture would look like inside the uh, houses um, um, and this, of course, would facilitate the sales um, aspect of uh, real estate. And it will be very useful for, um, for selling premium spaces in, uh, in upfront construction. And of course, you can do it uh, on site. And as we know, for example, the, the example of IKEA, you can also do it online. Um, yeah. So um, in, in architecture, uh, so um, what we saw uh, so far was focusing on visualization. So it, it was um, um, an attempt to visualize different uh, buildings from inside, from outside, to see the finishes, to see the um, impact on the surroundings. However, uh, what we intend to do is also to um, expand this application. So we, we don't on, only want the AR to be um, a means of visualization, we want to take it beyond that and uh, to explore the possibilities that it can offer in terms of design analysis. So uh, we can uh, develop our design and uh, once we see it on site and once we experience it, uh, we, can, um, we can develop the constructability review um, and create a, a better collaboration for the architect and the contractor. And it can even assist in the fabrication of buildings. Next, please. Uh, in terms of collaboration, uh, so um, uh, once we apply the AR on site, uh, everyone can collaborate much easily and grasp uh, quickly uh, what uh, the design looks like on site. So for example, here we can see the um, uh, example of different um, um, Havoc ex extensions, the pipes, the electrics, electric cables um, as applied on the site. And all you have to do is provide a um, uh, a marker image on a on a specific wall um, or any place in the on the site, and once you scan it, it locates you um, in relation to the project, and then you can see uh, the overall uh, render of the, the um, uh, of the design. And of course, you can still see the actual um, um, fragments of uh, of the site. Uh, now, one of the uh, very interesting aspects and very helpful ones is once you finish the project, you can actually 3D scan it. Uh, and before um, uh, closing off the walls and uh, um, introducing the final finish, uh, you 3D scan all the connections, all the um, um, entries and exits of the pipes and what have you, um, and all the different uh, kind of intricate um, um, intersections. And um, you uh, save them. And then once you have, uh, uh, if you ever have to go back to the site to change something, to fix something, you already have the information of the location of these uh, connections behind the wall. So you don't have to, um, you don't have to um, kind of rely on the um, maybe sometimes inaccurate um, equipment that we have. 
Next, please. Uh, so now Narmin will uh, go ahead and talk about uh, our experiment in the urban design studio and our work with our um, um, great students uh, in the course. Uh, of course, Narmin spent um, many months doing her master's uh, thesis um, in this regard, and she produced uh, amazing um, um, products, uh, kind of um, conclusions, and it was a really uh, great experiment. Um, um, so yes, please go ahead, Narmin. Thank you. Um, so let's start talking about urban design and education in practice. I will start with the education part and how to use augmented reality in urban design education. And then Dr. Janset will continue with the practice of urban design through augmented reality. Um, so first of all, I will introduce um, this first case of um, this example of here maps. Um, if you saw, all, when you saw all of the things that you can do on the scale of a building, let's say, or an interior design, imagine the kind of information that you have in, in the scale of a city or um, an urban setting. So imagine having all that information stored in one application and can be triggered and viewed and interacted with through um, one handheld device, through a marker image. So how, how amazing would that be if you have all that information of an entire city and all those urban layers stored in one marker image through one application that everyone can access. So that took us to try to experiment with that on uh, an educational level. So the first case we're going to talk about is uh, a, a case study that is done by the Technical University of Catalonia in Barcelona. So what they did was they wanted to design a sculpture and try to place it through augmented reality in a public space. So basically it had, uh, the, the, the course was broken down into the three, three phases, which are the initial content creation, they design and they capture. Then they prepare it for augmented reality and on-site verification. They go to the site and they test it out. And from the site, they get their feedback of the model, whether it was in correct scale, whether the materials they used were good enough, um, whether uh, people interacted well with it and they adjust their designs accordingly from the feedback that they gain from the site itself. So uh, the proposals before and after the visits were evaluated regarding to the quality of the models produced, the site integration, the scale location materials and the form of, of uh, the models on the site and the subjective opinion about the quality of the proposal from uh, the students themselves from the uh, people passing by and so on. So it's supported that using augmented reality applications in mobile devices, it results in significantly greater academic performance of the students. Not only the academic performance would increase, but as we found out later, is that um, the, the designs themselves are more mature, they're more context sensitive. So when we took the case and started to uh, try to implement and integrating augmented reality in our own conventional urban design studios, Basically, um, we studied um, the phases that students go through in urban design education. So they have the data collection, the analysis, the synthesis, definition of the major problems, they create a vision, objectives, and strategies. They develop the project and they visualize the final image of the intervention. And throughout the first phase itself, the data collection and the analysis and the synthesis, there are multiple and multiple layers of information that you can gather for an urban site. As we have seen, um, there, there are lots of layers and the connection of those layers sometimes can be difficult for the students to visualize and to imagine. So augmented reality can definitely offer a solution. And that's what we saw. So basically we used multiple tools and we taught the students how to use them. One of them is the uh, real-time development engine Unity. We used multiple software development tools such as AR Core, Proforia and so on that I will discuss with you later on. And um, we uh, decided to integrate augmented reality in four main axes in the urban design course as an analytical tool, as a design development tool, as a visualization tool, and as a public participation tool. So it's used image tracking, which we discussed earlier, the marker-based AR, the plane detection, which detects horizontal planes in your environment and places virtual models on them, and location-based augmented reality. And uh, according to those techniques, uh, we first implemented Augmented reality as an analytical tool. So the students studied an area in Amman, Jordan, which is the Citadel Hill in Amman. Um, they gathered all the information that they could and they connected those layers and they transformed those layers from 2D input to three-dimensional data. 
and after modeling it through uh, building information modeling systems, Revit and so forth, and uh, placing it in Unity, they were able to transform it into an augmented reality model. So as you see this model here through the application, uh, you, you only try you trigger the, the, the scan the image and it triggers the experience and you can toggle the uh, layers on and off. So you can see the parking locations, you can see whatever suggestions that they had, you can see multiple layers, the transportation and so on on this model. And that helped them turn on and off the layers and make those connections by visualizing actually what is happening when those layers um, interact. Um, another tool uh, way to use it was using augmented reality as art. So this video is from one of our students' work. Um, it's from her balcony. So when she goes outside and she looks at the citadel hill from her balcony, she can see a cat jumping on the citadel and the citadel reconstructed. And um, this way you can act, uh, you can add elements that are more interactive and say kind of fun to the site itself. Another uh, experiment was creating AR murals. So when you walk around the site, you, only you, you don't only design the physical space, you now get the chance to design the virtual space. What happens virtually in your location? So you can add artworks, you can add uh, drawings, you can add animations in that site. So the virtual and the physical, they work together. So by walking around and scanning the areas around you, you can get information, you can get drawings, you can get lots, lots of, of content that can be placed virtually in your site. Another way that we used it was augmented reality as infographic content. So as you see in this video, it's, it's, a, it's a blind map. It's a, it's a map of the site itself, the city of Helena Man, that has no information whatsoever. It works as a marker. So once it is tracked, once it's scanned, you can um, interact with the buttons and you can place layers and different layers of information. You can add the parking stops, the commercial activities, the touristic attractions, the vehicular circulation, even the pedestrian circulation. You can turn it on and off and see the points where these, uh, these layers of information can work together and can offer insight that you could have, couldn't have possibly seen in normal 3D drawings. And imagine how many maps or layers that you ne needed to produce to actually have all this information on paper. So it's one map with all this information at once through augmented reality. Uh, the other phase was actually using it for design development. So uh, in the model that they built in their analysis phase, they started integrating their designs onto that model itself. And they were starting to design the virtual space, as we said, with the real physical space. Uh, and one of the very nice things that they were able to do because they were presenting their work in, in an application form is that a mobile application, they were able to create immersive virtual experiences. So they would render 360 images and they can actually immerse people in their designs. So not only did they work with AR, they actually worked with VR. So this is one of the scenes that was produced during the course and rendered. And you can actually go through and experience this immersive experience, this uh, the site itself. This is another example of uh, the students' work. Um, so one of the most important things that they got to experiment with is that um, they could rely on data that is uh, used from Google Maps, let's say satellite images, street view, uh, 360 visualizations, and they could immerse the people in their designs. So later on, after the design was developed to a proper stage, you could possibly, they could move on to the later stage, which is the design visualization. So basically they used their final models and they transformed them into world scale augmented reality. World scale augmented reality is what allows you to make the shift. You shift the designer from the bird's eye view, from viewing your model and your design on a screen to viewing it on site to scale in full scale. So it's finally, you can sense the, the, the material, you can sense the scale, you can sense how it interacts with the context itself. So you humanize the final product and you produce interventions that are sensitive to this urban and social context. So after uh, creating those models, they were able in the video, you can see you place the virtual model in full scale on site. You can control the placement and check whether your dimensions are correct and uh, everything you did is correctly uh, done. The materials are good. Uh, and you can walk through it. You can even add creative elements like a whale floating. This is the scene where you walk through and look outside and so on. So all the students were, were able to create this experience and 
take it to even the next level in this course, which is the level of, of, of introducing the public to this experiment, which is public participation, to actually ask the people and let them experience their designs. And for the first time, people are actually able to understand, even non-professionals, they are able to uh, fully grasp this, this uh, project that is supposed to be a very complex urban project. So uh, they created an application, the final application of this urban design course, which included all of their work, their site analysis, their design development, the world scale augmented reality, the virtual scenes, the experimentation of the images and the videos, and they posted this application on social media because back then was um, still is the COVID pandemic and it was difficult to uh, reach the site. So they tried um, as much as possible to give this, this software to as many people as possible so they can actually work with this, um, let's say, innovative approach. So there was a very positive reaction towards the idea of AR applications to showcase potential urban development projects. So lots of people, they had the desire for this implementation as a, as a means of public participation and voting. So if any future developments happen in the city, people are actually willing to use this and, and give their opinion in, in regards to the designs that are being presented. So uh, there are multiple challenges that we faced. Uh, some of them would be uh, the utilization of different operating systems because you have students that use iOS, the others that use Android, and they have sort of different ways to approach these oper operating systems for development. There's also the steep learning curves of programming languages. If you intend to do this from scratch for advanced augmented reality experiences, you're gonna have to learn a programming language. Um, also to convert and visualize 2D data into 3D models. How can we see 2D information in 3D? Handheld devices compatibility. Um, some of the software development kits and uh, mobile phones used, they need to have a certain uh, level of um, uh, platform. Like let's say um, Android has to be 26 and above, iOS uh, minimum of uh, 10, uh, 11 and so forth. So there are certain compatibility issues. The inaccuracy of GPS technology, because um, GPS, as we said, it can have um, an inaccuracy um, of around 20 meters, I believe. So um, using for location based augmented reality, using a visual positioning systems, or as we showed earlier, the SLAM technology, that would be better, especially if you laser scan and have point clouds and feature points already created for the site, you can have incredible accuracy. Uh, the handheld devices, there's the screen glare uh, from the sun and the overheating because augmented reality systems, especially when they are heavy, they require processing load that is, is quite high to run. Uh, you need to also know how to approach creating uh, models for such experiences. So the optimization of materials, the textures and the 3D models. And finally, occlusion management issues, especially when you are dealing with uh, non-flat surfaces, let's say hard terrains and so forth. So um, that sums up the... Um, uh, educational experiment for urban design. And now uh, Dr. Janset will explain how to use uh, augmented reality for urban design practice as a tool for visualizing master plans and so forth. So please, Dr. Janset. Uh, thank you. Uh, so um, as we've seen our uh, first experiment in implementing um, augmented reality in the education of urban design, it, um, it showed us a lot of um, guidelines towards further applications it raised a lot of questions, not just about uh, the technicalities um, of the use of augmented reality and the equipment, but also there were ethical questions, questions of um, um, ease of use for different stakeholders, um, um, uh, questions of the desire of, um, of um, all people to uh, be engaged with this, because some, some people are actually they prefer um, a more, let's say, more tangible um, um, manners of interacting with urban design. However, uh, we, um, uh, we went on and um, tried to implement uh, the augmented reality um, technology in another project. And this project was, um, um, was actually um, about a very beloved um, component of our city, which is the uh, the little river which Amman had, uh, which called the Sail, Sail of Amman. So um, historically, if we can go to the next slide, please. Historically, Amman, uh, the city, uh, grew around a, a seasonal river, uh, which used to be its heart, its green lung, its uh, kind of source of life uh, throughout the different layers of history from the Roman times to the Islamic uh, times to then to the Ottoman uh, town uh, to the modern city. 
uh, however, with, uh, with, with time and uh, with the advancement of, uh, with the expansion of the city uh, and the, uh, um, let's say, the stress on the infrastructure, uh, this uh, little rivulet, uh, the said was roofed uh, and was covered and thus some of the memory of Amman was, um, uh, was extinguished, was hidden, was uh, concealed. And um, um, with time, uh, this infrastructure was actually um, um, incapable, not capable to, um, to cope with the amount of stormwater which, um, which Amman uh, downtown receives. So that resulted in uh, uh, flooding, especially in the uh, last uh, few years. If you can see the image on the next slide, it will uh, perhaps show us what I mean. Um, yes, here we see the, an image of Amman, um, a picture of Amman from the 40s, which shows the, uh, the stream of the sail uh, going through the city and going to the location of uh, the Ras Lain area, Ras Lain area uh, which is to the left um, of, the, of the picture, and which, you, which will be our case study for this project. So um, now the downtown is flooding, we have uh, losses in the millions of dinars, uh, losses of property, um, um, uh, threat to uh, livelihoods. And on the same time, we have this nostalgia towards um, uh, reviving the sale. So a lot of architects, a lot of urban planners, a lot of uh, different um, uh, Amanis and Jordanians are calling for the um, uh, revival of the sale, uh, be that um, um, symbolically uh, through um, narratives and sculptures and presenting it in different ways, or directly and literally through exposing and daylighting some sections of the um, uh, of the sail channel of the roof of the sail. Uh, so uh, we thought, why not explore that? Why not experiment with these ideas and propose uh, different alternatives uh, based on um, actual and implementable uh, infrastructure solutions? So um, and see how that will uh, affect the urban uh, layout of the area and the different aspects of. Um, um, the city life in that um, uh, district. So what we did is that we um, uh, proposed um, two alternatives based on, let's say, uh, proper principles of the design of um, um, stormwater infrastructure based on networking and providing uh, green solutions and gray solutions, of course, because, and uh, the providing hybrids for them. Um, so the main uh, um, goal was uh, to present an alternative which would be sustainable, which would save the downtown from the flooding and which would provide uh, the Ammanis and the city with much needed green space and maybe even blue spaces for the city and reviving the whole area. Um, yeah, so here we can see images produced for the um, uh, different alternatives. Um, uh, they focused on providing uh, green spaces, providing pedestrian uh, realm, uh, a rich pedestrian realm and uh, providing access to water, which is very limited in the city of Amman. Uh, so what we did is we, we proposed two scenarios. They were conceptualized, uh, schematically designed. Uh, then they were built at 3D models and presented through AR applications. Uh, dif using different modes uh, of visualization like 360 images, as uh, Nervine explained before. Uh, we also used, um, um, we produced an application uh, which used target uh, image. So you can actually uh, explore this model at, at your home. You can like, um, manifest it in front of you. And we also produced a, a world uh, scale um, application where you actually can go to the site and be, um, be immersed uh, in, the, um, uh, in the project. So the, uh, the current context, it's actually, um, it is um, more or less an urban island. Uh, currently it is populated by cultural buildings. So it is the island where we have uh, the municipality, the Greater Amman municipality, we have a national museum, we have um, um, a very important uh, stop for the bus uh, rapid transit station, which we have been waiting for um, for a long time now. There is a cultural center, Al Hussein Cultural Center, and there is an old park with the original uh, spring of Amman, Ras Lain. Uh, so it is a very, um, uh, let's say, popular area in Amman. It's culturally oriented. However, the uh, context it's in, it's a bit uh, rundown. Um, it is being, um, it is um, kind of going through the process of. Um, um, of people leaving the old uh, parts of the city and going to the newer parts because they are more, um, um, more provided for and have better services. 
So um, um, this region does need this kind of um, activator. It needs um, a new anchor uh, that people would um, uh, be attracted to and which would kickstart a regeneration in the real estate and um, uh, activities in this area. So the first alternative was quite conservative. I mean, it still provided um, um, solutions for the storage of rainwater, stormwater, so it doesn't flow down to the downtown. So it would facilitate um, um, facilitate a safer uh, realm in the, um, in, in the downstream where the downtown is. It provided um, um, tanks as a gray uh, infrastructure solution under the paved areas in the, uh, in the island, in this um, um, municipality island or cultural island. Uh, it's kept the, the existing uh, buildings as is, and it is projected to, um, like if, if you actually going to implement it, to be um, um, able to be fulfilled by 2030. So it's a mid-range, kind of a short mid-range um, uh, vision for this area. The second alternative was um, much more um, visionary or let's say um, dreamy. So it was um, a longer range project. It imagined, um, it, uh, we played with the idea, what, imagine if uh, this island was not built up. Imagine if it was left as a green space. Imagine if it contained some of the water which flows every year down to the um, uh, downtown and it contained it in a proper way. So we have the um, uh, the lakes, as we see in other countries, we have um, uh, green areas, we have pedestrian walkways, bicycles, we have playgrounds for children, we have uh, open space for different people to use. And of course, this kind of a green space, a green lung for the city would activate all of the surroundings, will attract new users, will attract the youth to come and use it, it will attract also investors and restaurant owners and uh, um, the housing, it will kickstart um, um, a real generation in this, um, in this district. Next, please. Uh, so as a next step, um, we built them in 3D and, um, and, and produced an application because we wanted to see how people would react to that. So the idea is to um, uh, uh, present um, an image um, of, uh, of the different ideas uh, that uh, we have uh, garnered from um, uh, research and narratives in the media. Uh, and present them to the people to, um, so they can actually immerse themselves in that and see what they look like. So, uh, for example, the people who are, are calling for daylighting the sale or exposing, bringing back the water to Amman, uh, they would be able to interact with, with an actual um, park which has this image manifested. So this uh, application uh, was published on, um, on social media, we presented it to the students, we presented it to, directed to the students, but also on social media so people could use it um, independently. Uh, yes, please. Um, and the interaction, and of course we observed the interaction because um, um, we are trying to develop the tool so it's easier to use for the end user. Uh, and this is what it looks like. It presents different, um, of course, it presents a background to the project, explains everything, it explains the different alternatives. And then the user can explore it. Um, you can go through it. You can activate certain areas and uh, see the different scenarios which are applied here. So this is the, uh, would be the market base or the tabletop um, uh, model of the, um, um, uh, of the project. And this is the 360, uh, 360 um, component of the application where you stand in a space and you can look all around it. And um, um, in, in, uh, in comparison to the uh, tabletop model, the, uh, the 360 uh, perspectives um, are more immersive because they are better rendered, but they are uh, more fixed because you cannot actually move in them while you can move in the tabletop model. Um, yeah, so we can see the quality of the render, uh, which is quite important for uh, presentation of uh, urban design projects. Here is um, a very interesting experiment we also had is that we, um, we visited the site and we showed it to participants uh, in wall scale. So for example, at the bridges, the different water bodies that you see, they don't exist, they exist in the application. Uh, the new buildings are uh, merged with the old ones. So it's a, it's a very cohesive and um, an integrated um, um, presentation of the project to the user. 
Uh, of course, here, for example, we had a question, uh, to what extent should we render the, um, and, um, um, the project in 3D and uh, how realistic should it be? Because um, um, in previous experiences, we found that when the project is too realistic, the person actually does not perceive it properly. They, they just um, um, see it as part of the site. So it's more difficult for them to understand it. So this is one of the questions that was raised, like uh, to what extent should uh, the realism of the, um, of the idea of the project be uh, developed? Next, please. Um, yeah, so here we can see uh, some images from the application of the project um, on site, uh, especially in the park area. Uh, the top image is, is the comparison left and right between the park area before and after. Uh, then we have in front of the municipality building, we can see this lake being proposed, an artificial lake to hold the uh, stormwater. Um, um, uh, it's part of the uh, green and gray infrastructure in that area. And below we have um, also a proposal for a bridge and another lake. Um, in an open space, which is now being used as a parking lot. And you can see the background of the building is there. So you can actually um, relate the project, the proposed project to uh, the, its surroundings. While also we have the new buildings and a bridge and uh, what have you different urban elements, uh, which are superimposed um, on, the, um, on the image. Next please. Uh, it was very important for us to receive feedback from people, so uh, from different users. We tried to uh, um, kind of um, um, involve different age groups. Um, so this is um, um, an output of a survey from social media and from direct interviews. Um, we, for example, um, I'm not going to go into detail right now, but uh, um, mostly we covered uh, age groups and different age groups, um, and we found that uh, people um, actually prefer the uh, second scenario, the genie one, and that they do have this innate need for a green space in Amman. Um, um, now, the, the brilliant thing was that we uh, people actually proposed the different ideas of phasing, of how to, uh, like different methods of implementing the project. So they were able to interact with it and we were um, actually quite pleased that even um, the older uh, segment of the sample they were able to understand uh, and interact with the, um, um, with the idea and with the application, uh, although they did need some assistance with that. So they the usability of the application and the um, ability of different age groups and different uh, stakeholders to interact with it is very important for us. And we hope to develop it further in the future. Um, next, please. Yep, so uh, the future now, Namin will uh, tell us more about um, uh, the different potentials of uh, augmented reality and how to start with it. Please, Namin. Yes, so um, this is one of the exciting parts of the presentation. So how can you start with augmented reality now in the quickest way possible? It all depends on what you are aiming to create, uh, what, you are, what kind of experience that you want to make. So if you want to start uh, learning something that you can create advanced augmented reality experiences from scratch, uh, you can start by using a, a powerful development engine, a real-time development engine, which are usually used, usually, usually used for uh, game development, such as Unity and Unreal Engine. Um, these real-time development engines, they have certain uh, software development kits. These software development kits, they are uh, tools that usually combine a multiple um, a compiler, a debugger, and everything that you kind of need to create a software. So there is AR Core, which is used for Android development. Muforia is one of the simplest platforms of software development kits that can be used for uh, both for both iOS and Android, and it can be used with Unity. And it provides a variety of experiences. It's very simple. AR Kit is, um, is Apple's um, Apple software development kit for developing for iPhones and so forth. Unity has also the integration of both AR Core and AR Kit in something called AR Foundation. It comes pre-installed with Unity itself. Um, if you want to experiment with um, SLAM technology, which is uh, the simultaneous uh, localization and mapping, uh, which gives very accurate results, you have the Immersal SDK or the AR Way SDK. You can map your surroundings using their mapper, and then you can use that uh, map that you created and augment it. So you can have accurate uh, AR placements every time. Uh, you have Wikitude, which is one of the SDKs, but it is uh, commercial. 
mainly so you have to pay to use it. The same thing goes with uh, Zap AR. Um, what is even faster than that, if you don't want to create uh, advanced experiences and learn to program and everything from scratch, there are multiple plugins that are already existing and compatible with Autodesk products. So you can use, uh, you can use them with Revit, you can use them with any software that you currently already use. Because uh, many people are currently, many offices are using Enscape, they're using Twinmotion, they're using Lumion, they're using all these plugins that can immerse um, users in their products and show their clients another way to uh, view this uh, design. So uh, one of those, uh, some of those plugins are uh, Augment, uh, Augin, or Unity Reflect. So uh, once you install the plugin into Revit, you can just quickly uh, click on any model that you already designed and you can uh, create your augmented reality experience with a click of a button. Yes, it does have some limitations in terms of the material, material placement and the texturing and so on, but it gives you a head start and you can start experimenting as quickly as possible with what you can possibly do. And it's, it's really good for um, quick revisions, uh, experiencing the scale, uh, understanding you, the space that you're creating better. And it's, it's, it can be quite useful for a client to understand uh, the work that you are doing and the spaces that you are creating. So the things that you need to consider when choosing a suitable software development kit is the cost, because uh, pricing is the first distinguishing mark of the AR augmented reality SDKs. So if you want to try for the first time, the best options are the free open source SDKs that I showed earlier. Go with free, they offer the, they, they're not that limited. They actually, uh, before is one of the free ones that offers everything that you can possibly try to work with. The platform that you want to create for, are you working for iOS? Are you working for Android? Uh, what are the, the plans for the application? And the type of AR experience, are you, do you want to create something that's markerless? Do you want to create something that's marker based, that works with an image, that detects an object? You want SLAM support, you want GPS, um, it depends on what you want to create to choose your uh, software development kit. Does it have Unity support? If at some point you decide to create an, uh, a more advanced augmented reality experience for your project, does it support Unity to do that? And uh, one of the most important things uh, that we will, uh, that is slowly becoming actually very important nowadays is uh, whether it supports cloud storage or local storage. Because if it supports cloud storage, it can be an online experience, which takes us to our next point. Uh, what's next? So, um, let me just mute this. <laughs> so, Web XR, Web, web, web Extended Reality. This is what's, what's happening right now. So, um, you can now use the web, your browser, to go into augmented and virtual reality experiences. They are completely web-based. You don't need to install any applications. They run fully on the browser. Your client doesn't need to install an application. You can just uh, create that, uh, in, in the, that experience, host it on a website, host it on its own, um, um, yeah, exactly, a, a, web, a link, give it a link, and uh, anyone can just scan your code or go to your link and experience your project, whether it is VR or AR. So here is an example of uh, an augmented reality experience that actually uses uh, plane detection. So it, it scans your environment, it detects what horizontal planes are there, and it places an AR model of the treasury and Petra in your, in your room, in your living room, and you can experience, experiment with the model. And it's currently under development still, so it can be even more interactive. Um, a very nice example for web VR is that usually uh, when we deliver anything to our clients, um, it you deliver uh, a walkthrough, you deliver a video, uh, a, a rendered image. Now you can just give your client a link and when they click the link, they can go into this 3D space. They can select different materials. They can explore the design that you made them. Uh, they can take screenshots and show you what, what materials that they prefer. They can actually see the prices as you see in the example itself. So you deliver a full uh, virtual reality ready space that they can experiment with. They can walk around and they can give you suggestions. It's way more interactive than just giving them uh, an image, a rendered image that actually takes a lot of time to render or a video that also requires lots of processing. So uh, web VR is also something that is very exciting to look forward to. Uh, also, AR glasses. Uh, notice who, this, these are the, the, the Samsung glasses that they announced like shortly, um, only a few months so ago. So notice it's targeting uh, architects, basically interior designers. So the person is just wearing the glasses and he can step directly into their, in their design and even the clients can meet up with them through glasses, of course. 
So um, this is where we're heading. Samsung is producing them, Lenovo is producing them, Apple has promised them. So AR glasses uh, that are more affordable, more commercial are on the way. Also this. Nice, isn't it? Holography. Um, have you ever imagined that you can actually attend a concert of someone who passed away? So in Dubai, they're actually doing this. There are uh, holography concerts. Um, and not only for people, you can actually use holography it, it, uh, through a light technique. It enables a light field. It records a certain scene through light. And then later it reconstructs it. So it has a certain uh, way that it works. So we, you recreate objects. So it, uh, more and more, it's becoming more available because they're producing a looking glasses. Looking glass is, is uh, kind of a box that it can create holographic models. And you can, you can show your clients a holographic representation, a hologram of your 3D model, and you can actually interact with it. So it's one of the uh, quite interesting things that you look for, you can look forward to. And uh, what is even, is even more exciting is uh, something that Microsoft came up with and only announced two weeks ago, which is holoportation. Uh, only two weeks ago, the Microsoft has already announced Microsoft Mesh. So it will actually change the way we communicate in the virtual world. Using their HoloLens, you can now teleport as a person. So you can actually collaborate directly. Um, you, you place your models, uh, you create this environment, everything is, uh, is augmented. And uh, once you teleport, you can have face-to-face -face interaction when you're actually just a hologram. So it tracks, um, it, it maps the, the person, the user who's wearing this HoloLens and you can actually um, create a, this collaborative experience using this new platform. So um, very interesting things are on the way. And uh, I encourage everyone to try and start experimenting, experimenting with the simple stuff because we are definitely heading to this world of virtual um, and, and augmented experiences all around us. And thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. So um, having seen these kind of amazing and fantastic tools that um, 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 virtual and um, augmented uh, technology is going to offer us, um, 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 kind of, uh, it's good to see what the future holds for urban design. But of course, um, uh, in reality, we still um, have to um, um, develop uh, the tools um, that we have. And uh, that is what we uh, try to show you through our uh, research and um, educational experiments um, and um, um, uh, also share our conclusions and results with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Janset and architect Narmin. Indeed, I cannot wait to have a holoportation Zoom meeting soon. Yeah, yeah it was indeed. <laughs> Now, my initial, my initial takeaway from this very timely presentation, you know, I mean, one year ago, the COVID-19 crisis, you know, has hit most of us unprepared. And, you know, we really didn't realize how quickly we will adopt, um, needed to adopt, especially, you know, we are in the construction and design and, you know, real, especially the real estate companies. We're facing very similar issues for not being able to, you know, to visit the construction site or move on with, you know, the selling and renting and stuff. So um, this, this, this tool, you know, the first, um, um, first had experience with the AR and VR for me uh, was in 2015. Uh, that was like six years ago. But then it didn't like, you know, pick up instantly in the market. Um, and now we are, you know, after six years, um, um, we are now talking about it again. Um, um, I was just, um, last week I was at the Expo 2020 Dubai. Um, they have, you know, they, they're using this platform um, in the entrance. So um, it's, 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 we are now really looking forward on this um, um, tool. Um, for us and, and, and for the whole world. Now, uh, VR presently is very powerful communicator. Uh, you know, it allows our, our 
clients, contractors especially, and other stakeholders in the design to better see and understand the project, you know, if we're talking about our industry, uh, which in turn can lead to a more, you know, um, informed decisions and, you know, minimize potential mistakes. Now, the question is, yes, I heard, I heard architect Narni mentioned a while ago about the challenges on the site supervision, but the overall challenges right now, um, have we identified those things? Are, 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 are we still facing some few challenges um, with this tool? With uh, using augmented reality, you mean? Yeah. Well, um, kind of yes, because um, it depends on the tools that you have. It depends on uh, the techniques that you are using, and uh, the tracking itself is is kind of um, still. You need know, some people have problems with the tracking because sometimes it uh, it doesn't stay in place. Uh, it's jittering. It's uh, it has some kind of issues, but yeah. it requires more advanced tools, as I explained. Uh, earlier, because if you use laser scanning, let's say you have an accurate model that you can actually augment. You have uh, something that is stable. Um, if you use uh, online services that um, are connected, you, they are something that's called Google anchors. Mm. So um, there are solutions around it, but when you're first starting off, it can be quite challenging to find those solutions and it needs, there's a quite steep learning curve to actually get to that point where you can actually come around these, um, these problems. A learning curve from us who's utilizing this product and also to our clients because you know um yeah you know, we probably i can i can i can be part of the millennial we the millennials you know we are can, can easily adopt on this technology um but you know with with, with my parents you know uh, um asking them to you know to, to to see these tools and stuff and especially the clients um, yeah. Probably that's that's what we should also be aiming for about you know more um, 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 conversation like this, more um, um, talks about you know the AR and VR, and we are really privileged for you guys to you know um, start our second year in COVID season of, of of having this webinar with you. Now let's let's go now to the Q and A. Um, we have like a few questions here. Uh, we can start with um, a question from Noor Hanania. Do you see there might be a future where augmented dreams become a regular thing, like people paying to experience a dream or memory to escape reality? That is a very nice idea. And I, I do see that happening because uh, not only can you use this uh, technology for um, like let's say a fields that are um, more like education and uh, architecture and urban design and so on, you can add this gamification element. You can have these experiences where you can control dreams. Let's say if you wear a head mounted display and you can step into something that of your own design. So it is happening, uh, a memory to escape reality. Yes, if you look at the Microsoft Mesh thing uh, that they released, they can actually record memories. So uh, you can actually replay them in your head while you're, you're wearing that uh, high mounted display. So you can go into memories, go into dreams, go into experiences that you create and control. It can be very interactive and actually fun to play with. So, yeah. All right. Um, we have another one from um, Vidhi Sa. Hello, everyone from India. My question is how, yeah, this is the question of most everybody. Yeah. How much is uh, the adaptability of AR apps in the daily life for client presentation or design proposal? Uh, can I answer um, um, this question? Yes, so, uh, this, uh, this was one of our main concerns um, because so far we do have the, uh, the applications, the technology, the ability to do that, but it's not geared towards um, um, urban design. It, there are some applications which are geared toward architectures. For example, uh, the cases we examples we've seen, they are implemented in architecture and they do provide this kind of a, um, a 3D overlay of different systems over actual space, uh, according to different um, uh, locating techniques as Nermin explained, either marker-based or you know, like a 3D scan uh, the room or what have you. So it is a challenge to produce something um, um, easy to use, 
um, um, which is, would be integrated in our uh, programs, which we use um, already, but also which, which would produce a high quality of um, output. So for example, we do have plugins at the moment, but they do not produce something mm. uh, easily uh, maneuverable or of a high quality of render. So they will look very uh, kind of uh, abstract and gimmicky and uh, it's very difficult to relate to them. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Okay, from Alex, um, we have the question. Hello, can extended reality resolve flashes? Can generate design be factored in as far as possible class, uh, clash resol uh, resolutions? And then the other one is we are considering either going with Unity or Unreal Engine for AR. Is it true that Unity requires much more knowledge in coding or programming than Unreal Engine? Okay, uh, I can take that. So uh, let's start with the first one, can extended reality resolve clashes and so forth. It depends on how good of a programmer you are. Because, um, you know, it depends on how, how complicated the experience is uh, and so forth. So um, that, that's how I can answer this question actually. Yeah. Um, as for the considering or oh, going with Unity or Unreal Engine, um, um, I believe Unity is easier because um, it, it's, um, okay, Unreal Engine offers the, the visual uh, programming. It offers the blueprints and it uses C++. Mm -hmm. In Unity, it actually uses C Sharp, which is object-oriented programming. Uh, it's it's object-oriented language. It's, it's quite easy to catch like uh, quickly. And there are also plugins for visual programming in Unity. So if you are planning on entering, uh, choosing whether Unity or Unreal Engine, from what I have been working with the last, let's say, year, two years or so, um, Unity is uh, easier and it has lots and lots of uh, compatible software development kits. Mm. So most of kits that are produced to create augmented reality experiences, they are always compatible with Unity. You will find some that are uh, compatible with Unreal Engine, but I think uh, Unity is, is more flexible in terms of creating AR experiences. Okay. All right, thank you. Now, next question is courses for creating AR for architects by Amar Naber. So where they can learn this one? Or are there any courses in the uni or, you know, currently right now? Uh, for architects, I don't think so. Uh, but for creating AR, yes, there are plenty of available courses online uh, that you can find easily for creating even if you just go onto YouTube, you can find simple tutorials and how to get started at least, and then you can experiment on your own. Yeah, actually, that's uh, the first thing that I come into my mind. YouTube. Yeah, uh, yeah YouTube you, has everything. You as well. Y yes, uh, yeah, Dr. Jansen. Yes, um, although um, schools of architecture have taken the route of digital technology, so a lot of uh, schools over all over the world offer different um, um, like digital techniques like, uh, I don't know, parametric architecture, um, fabrication, um, all of that. But AR is still not very strong. I mean, it's considered part of visualization and it's more oriented towards computer science um, disciplines yeah. um, rather than, than uh, architecture. So we kind of are capitalizing on this gap and we really believe in, in it as a tool of uh, presentation and develop, design development and participation as well. It's, it's really, it, is, it does have a very strong future and immersing the, the participant or the end user in the design. Uh, so we uh, really believe that it, it, it is a very valid uh, tool for the mm. future. But unfortunately, so far, we kind of, we, um, um, we haven't found uh, something which is focusing only on that. Yeah, yeah, but for sure, very soon we'll see on that. Yeah, yes, it, it, it is emerging. All right, we have here from Hassan Abbas. Designing a building or an urban development phase using AR to present the project to the client or the design team. Can we use live sync with the AR program? For example, anything I change in the 3D model, it directly changes when viewing it on the AR. Yes, that I can is see definitely a nod. possible. Definitely yeah, possible. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the, the, the nice things that actually um, Unity Reflect, it's the plugin from Unity that can be installed for Revit it's one of the nice things that it offers. So there's a live link. So once you go enter AR, you can change everything on Revit and it automatically automatically change on the client's phone while he is viewing it in scale in real life. So he can tell you to please move the door 
to the side to the left, you just move the door and grab it. So yeah, that is possible with Unity Reflect. All right, we have here from Hassan Atamish, which app was used on creating this web VR? Okay, uh, for creating the web VR, um, you just need to export the model as GLTF, which can be exported using Blender, let's say, uh, or you can move it to Unity, but mainly for developing any 3D experiences for the web, you use, um, there are uh, available JavaScript libraries uh, such as 3JS or A-Frame. So 3JS and A-Frame, they can be used to create such experiences, or even if you just create your model on Revit, and mm. you move it into Unity, you can just export it as WebGL. And that, that's all you need to actually host it on the website. So Unity, mm -hmm. WebGL. Okay, thank you. Now, I'm um, from K. Duncan Boner. What kind of uh, budget should an architecture firm set aside for starting AR use in practice? We principally use AutoCAD and some Revit. Uh, it depends on uh, the kind of plugins that you intend to use. Are you going with a commercial SDK that is like built annually, or are you going with something more mm -hmm. free as a plugin? So, um, if you want to use handheld devices, the mobile phones, or an iPad that's already existing within your company, or you actually want to buy a head mounted display, which can cost up to $3,000. So, um, it depends on the kind of experience that you want to create, the SDK that you want to make, or the handheld devices. So, if you use your handle device and you use the existing free plugins, uh, it's free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's the, the student version. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. All right. Okay. We have here from architect Alan Atilano. Um, he's from um, Dubai. Um, one of the issues that we face with AR and VR is that the current staff within the company are not familiar with all the apps for AR, VR. And because of the steep learning curve, outsourcing is being explored as an initial solution. Are there companies that uh, specialize in creating the platform from start to end? Um, I, perhaps there, there are, yeah. Right? Yeah, there should be. There should be companies that can do that. But if you, um, a few workshops, some training, and the staff can get more familiar with it, and you can save lots of money. Yeah, I, 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 I know one company here in Dubai. Um, so it's available. You look it up. I'm, I'm certain like lots of people are actually uh, starting to get more into this field nowadays, especially for architecture. All right, from Nart Shawash, about the SLAM, SLAM part of the AR that you use. Are there any parameters you can adjust to your needs or it is used as a redid um, black box? SLAM um heavily yeah. depends on available sensors does this mean mm -hmm. that user might have different experiences depending of the available hardware okay uh so uh i'm taking all the answers <laughs> sorry um so uh the slam currently um basically it depends on the sdks that are being produced so for now the ones i showed the immersal and the ar way uh, there are no parameters that you can actually adjust and control it's just um it just uses this API and just use it as it is. As for the hardware, because it's, it's relatively new. So uh, we're talking about something that started maybe two years ago, um, one year ago, even Airway just launched maybe earlier this year. So um, yes, it does depend, depend heavily on the sensor. So um, does it uh, depend, the experience, is, does it um, highly differ? Um, it's definitely more accurate when you use an iPhone with a LiDAR sensor, yes. Uh, it's definitely more accurate when you use a hardware device that has a depth camera. So uh, yes, it, it kind of depends on that. Um, it, does it offer the same experience? Uh, it offers a relatively close experience. It's accurate either way, but it's way more accurate when you use a hardware that, um, ha that already has the equipment that, that's needed for such an experience. But it's, right. not, it's not a large difference. Yeah, I, I, probably this one is for uh, Dr. Jan said. Um, this question yeah. is from Saif Oran. Good evening from Jordan. My first question is, don't you think such idea needs to be taught as an individual course in the first year of architecture students? And my second question would be, how well can, be, uh, can this idea be implemented in the construction phases of the building? Thank you so much for the amazing and informative presentation. 
Um, yes, so um, of course we wish that it would be uh, integrated uh, very, very early in architectural education. However, as um, we've seen, um, it's still quite new and the learning uh, curve is uh, quite steep. So, um, I mean, we were lucky that our students uh, kind mm -hmm. of put up with it and they were uh, able and ready to, um, uh, to experiment and to learn it. And we're lucky to have Nermin as well, who is very fluent in um, like, um, I mean, she's an architect, but she's very interested in this um, uh, whole discipline. So, and she was able and uh, willing to put in the effort. But uh, for example, it was a very steep learning curve for me as well. Um, I mean, I've been practicing for years now, but uh, this was a mm. kind of an eye opening and a very um, um, a new experiment and a new way to look at the world. Uh, now, uh, the, of course, the requirement now is to produce something simpler and easier to use so that we could introduce it as part of our yeah. uh, visualization courses, which happen very early in the education process. And now for the construction, um, um, I suppose, um, yes, it can be implemented, of course, but uh, we are, it's still being developed. So uh, the AR technology and the VR technology is much more advanced than other disciplines. So um, our role is to develop it to be implementable and easy to use in construction, architecture, and urban design. And um, our experiments were part of that process. Yeah, as I can see here in the Q&A, there's a same sentiment from uh, Fadila, um, Fifi, uh, Shukri, as an architecture student, do you believe that professors and teachers will be open and accepting to such technologies when it comes to presenting our projects? We will be able to let go of the old-fashioned technical presentation. I, I believe that's, um, the, that's the calling. <laughs> Yes, of course. I mean, um, we were challenged by the whole online teaching learning process during COVID. So we already have to let go of the traditional ways and look into new ways and uh, kind of uh, uh, reconsider our whole understanding of presenting projects. So I think AR is coming. I mean, it, we will see it all over uh, and all over um, like different aspects of our life. So it's only natural and normal that it will be applied in architecture. Now, of course, it, it will take a lot of effort um, on the um, on the side of the students and the side of the um, educators uh, to, to implement it easily and make it easily accessible to the end user. All right. OK, so um, because we don't have much time now, um, we are limited on, on, on the time now, but we would love to have you know, this presentation needs to have a part two. Um, because the one hour is too little for so much information that you can, you can share, but we are really uh, privileged to have you uh, uh, with us tonight. Um, any last few words uh, before we, you know, we close this session? Um, uh, we can start with Dr. Jansen. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having us and thank you for all the attendees for um, um, participating in this discussion. Um, we are very excited about doing this and I mean we, we do have very ambitious plans for the future and it is not easy. I mean Nardine presented it as a, as a very easy process but it's, it's uh, <laughs> sometimes technology is clunky, sometimes the people are not very um, encouraged, sometimes the projects I mean they, they need to be uh, more interesting than the abstract the modernism that we are all used to. Uh, but it has a very exciting future, and I, I, I can visual, I can see in my mind already how it's going to be implemented. So, for example, for, for myself, I'm going to continue with this and uh, try to integrate it into uh, our education and uh, projects. All right, uh, architect Narmin, uh, yeah, few words, last few words. All right, uh, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for having us. I really hope you actually enjoyed this presentation. I hope it uh, added to your database. <laughs> um, I, I encourage everyone to go ahead and check out the plugins that we just suggested. Install it and just explore with it. Um, maybe you like it, maybe you find it easy. Maybe you wanna go further into exploring this um, way of visualization and keep in mind that this is a completely new way to experience, uh, experience projects in architecture. Whether you're a student, whether you are a practitioner, uh, you can now present your work in a mobile application. So imagine how that will change everything. So go ahead and try it out. And if you have any questions, you can always find me on LinkedIn. Just look me up and I'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, 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 for this night. Um, you know, 
my last word for this is, you know, AR and VR technology is envisioned to improve the current practices of architecture, um, whether it's a visualization, design process, building construction and processes, and um, engineering management systems. So um, for us, it's about time for us to adapt with this uh, a tool. This is the future. And what a way of... Uh, uh, better start to, 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 to learn from this is now, if you haven't been to. Um, again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Janset um, and architect Narmin. This webinar will be um, um, available soon um, on our, our website, um, and even on the AIA national website. Um, if any one of you want to share this um, um, webinar to your friends or you want to rewatch it, you know, feel free. Um, just keep in touch with, 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 with the AIA Middle East um, um, through our website. And that's www.aiamiddleeast.org. Again, thank you so much for um, having uh, you guys with us. And um, we'll see you on our next webinar. Thank you. Keep safe, everybody. Bye. Thank you.